Uh, I will say it's a, a pleasure to be here, and I'm a little biased. I live at the waterfront, and my uh, travels uh, are extensive around the country, uh, and this is probably, this, especially this time of year, the finest place in the country to be. Uh, let me uh, start. Let's see if this works. Yeah. All right. Let me go back because this is, the, the, this is sort of the name of the talk. This, the stagnation uh, narrative is over. Now, let me tell you a story. Uh, I had to give a speech on uh, November 10th. And on November, the, the evening of November 9th, uh, this was the name of the speech. And I was you know, out, of, out of state giving this talk. And uh, I read it, and I stayed up till 2 in the morning rewriting it. Uh, uh, because, like you, I expected a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. And um, uh, I don't know if any of you like football, but uh, essentially, uh, I'll just... Uh, this is what I, after November 8th, this is what I essentially um, named the thing. Uh, and again, I, I think I had some help, I don't know. Uh, uh, Now, if I'm an economist, I think virtually any economist will tell you if you want to grow an economy, you have to do four things. You basically have to lower tax rates, you have to have less burdensome and less capricious regulation, you have to reduce barriers to international trade, and you have to reduce barriers to credit creation. And, and keep that in mind as I go through this, because what I'm going to talk to you about uh, is, is uh, in the first part of the talk, is what Trump says he's going to do. Um, uh, it, it's it's going to be interesting as to whether he, how much of this gets through Congress, and um, certainly in the in the first uh, uh, seven weeks of the presidency, it's been uh, interesting to say the least. But let's talk about what what uh, what we're in for. Uh, first of all, you're going to have uh, lower tax rates. Uh, and, and this is uh, what one of his proposals is. This is the one on, on basically his website. Essentially, to reduce personal tax rates to a maximum rate of 33, down from 39.6. Uh, the lowest rate is going to be 12%, the high, and, and essentially uh, um, it's down, uh, down from 15. There's going to be higher standard deductions and lower uh, a cap on itemized deductions, essentially. Um, and, but the big news is corporate tax rates. He's talking about reducing corporate tax rates from 39 to 15 and having a, a repatriation tax on, on cash outside of the, the country of only 10%. And that will incent a lot of people to bring back a lot of money. Now, why is corporate tax rates a big deal? Because right now, the US has the highest corporate tax rate in the industrialized world. And so all the incentives are for people not to be here instead of to be here. Uh, he's talking about uh, reducing the US corporate tax rate, so it would be the lowest tax rate in the industrialized world. And if that were to happen, that would be a game changer in terms of where corporations locate, where they choose to expand. Um, and, and that's a, a major part of uh, what, his, what he wants to do. Um, in terms of regulation, he wants to reduce regulation, repeal parts of Dodd-Frank, which essentially uh, are constraining lending. Uh, and obviously, he's going to uh, uh, do some pretty draconian things to the EPA. Um, and here's why. Uh, if the, this is uh, something called uh, economically significant regulation, is a regulation that has more than $100 million in costs. And uh, you can see that, that it's, it's really increased significantly, um, uh, especially under President Obama. And he thinks, Trump thinks, that that has been a constraint on the growth of the U.S. And he's probably right, quite frankly. Um, he is also talking on top of that of massive infrastructure spending and uh, that would create a lot of jobs in construction, steel manufacturing, transportation, water, telecom, and energy. Uh, and quite frankly, both parties kind of agree that that needs to be done because our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our airports are falling apart. Uh, if you've been around the world, you can see the difference 
uh, in, in the industrialized world anyway, between our infrastructure and the infrastructure um, of the rest of the world. Um, and so that essentially is likely to happen uh, and happen fairly quickly. Okay, so um, in terms of energy, he wants us to be energy independent and uh, uh, that is likely to happen uh, quickly. Um, uh, and, and with, with uh, trade, obviously, uh, some draconian measures. Uh, he wants a protectionist stance. He wants a level playing field. And that is going to be a, a problem with China because that's the most unlevel of the playing fields with our significant trading partners. Uh, he's going to renegotiate NAFTA. I found it interesting, by the way, that both the president of Mexico and the prime minister of Canada agreed to renegotiate NAFTA before he had even asked. So uh, that tells you uh, essentially what's going on. The, uh, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership is out. Uh, other things, he's going to be tough on immigration, and we'll talk about that, because it's really an, a restructuring of immigration that's necessary. In effect, um, we are going to need labor from outside because we don't have enough labor to fulfill what he wants to do in, within the borders of this country at the moment. So that's going to turn out to be interesting. Uh, obviously, he's struggling with what to do with Obamacare, and he's a big advocate of school choice, which will benefit us. All right, now what keeps me up at night? Okay, And, and, and there, there are four things that keep me up at night. First, a trade war. In, in, in essence, is he negotiating or is he going to create a situation where we're going to have, have a trade war, especially with, with Mexico, and um, uh, that would hurt Mexico dramatically. It would hurt us as a state, but it would hurt Mexico more. Uh, it remains to be seen. Um, but uh, 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 essentially, um, this is a potential problem. Uh, other potential problems, the, this type of, these set of policies, um, uh, it have been tried four times in the 20th century, and they succeeded each time. And by the way, they were, they were tried by two Republicans and two Democrats. They worked like a charm. The big deal, though, is these policies were tried in the early stages of recovery, coming out of recession. They've never been tried 95, 96, 97 months into a recovery. And so um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when you are driving an economy into uh, essentially hyperspeed well into an expansion. And um, that's, again, going to create labor problems, interestingly enough. Uh, and uh, he's got to get his policies so they coordinate with one another. You can't try to prevent people from coming here when you need labor. Uh, again, you, and, and what types of labor? There are 500,000 high-tech jobs going wanting. Uh, but also, I don't know if any of you are in the construction industry, the number one issue in the construction industry right now is lack of labor. Um, most of the uh, labor, uh, if you've ever been to a job site, comes from south of the border, and um, they're just not coming uh, at, at the moment. Uh, interestingly enough, we can talk about why they're not coming, but it's, it's not what you think. It, it's, it's, it's something over which he has no control. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so there's something called potential GDP. How much, where the economy should be if all its resources were properly employed. And uh, this is, you can see that the blue line, and, and which is, is uh, potential, and the red line, which is actual, deviate. Let's take a closer look at it. Uh, in this cycle, the, the, the uh, uh, difference between actual and potential was very, very high coming out of the, the, uh, the Great Recession. Uh, and again, s uh, years later, uh, it is still, we're still below potential GDP. That gap will close rapidly uh, under Trump's policies, especially, again, if the tax policies uh, occur and there is no trade war. Okay. Um, one thing, though, that you have to be aware of is that only part of what he says he's going to do is, 
is it possible to accomplish? Uh, at the end of World War II, 50% of all the jobs in this country were manufacturing jobs. 1975, about 22% of all the jobs in the country were manufacturing jobs. And now, uh, basically a little more than 8% of all the jobs in the country are manufacturing jobs. The US is a country that produce, produces more services than goods. It's reliant on, th on, on uh, it, we just don't produce things anymore because it is more cost effective to have them produced in other markets. What Trump is doing will be a holding pattern in terms of keeping jobs here, manufacturing jobs here a little longer, but this is a trend that is not likely to be changed in the long run. All right, so again, you can expect faster growth in jobs and GDP. You can expect higher interest rates. Uh, you'll probably get that today, as a matter of fact. Uh, inflation's going to be higher. Not hyperinflation, but certainly uh, probably around 3%. Um, you're going to get higher after-tax profits. Uh, you're going to have a higher deficit. Um, international trade uh, could flourish, but it depends on, on uh, what his policies finally turn out to be. And again, we, we are going to be in a situation where we, where we are going to be perennially short of labor, just the opposite of what we've had. And for millennials, that means they're actually going to have to go to work, but we'll talk about that a little more. Um, it, now, um, you're also going to have a larger military. Uh, you're gonna, state taxes are going to mostly go away. Uh, political correctness, in case you haven't noticed, has sort of been on the decline. And um, uh, it would be almost impossible for any president, regardless of wh whether Hillary got elected or Trump got elected, it would have been impossible to get through the next four years without a recession. Uh, I shouldn't say impossible, it would be a low probability event, and here's why. Uh, the longest recovery in U.S. history is 120 months. We're at month 95 now. The chances of getting through another 48 months without a recession, very, very, very low probability. It just, it would be unprecedented in our history. Um, so again, we're facing the potential for significant positive change in economic growth. It's too early to determine, though, how much is going to get through Congress. But if done correctly, this is going to make a significant difference, like it or not. Um, and, and you'll see from consumer confidence surveys, consumers, whether they like Trump or not, are real happy about the perspectives for the economy, the prospects for the economy. All right, so let's talk about what's going on now. I wanted to give you that as background because there's been so much garbage floating around the news, you really don't know what you're looking at. So um, can the expansion last? Okay. Uh, <laughs> The answer is yes, okay? Is the sky falling? Absolutely not, okay? Um, now, oops, let me go back one. Uh, this is uh, GDP over the last 50 some odd years, and as you can see, uh, this expansion by historic standards has been mediocre, anemic, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that is probably going to change a little over the next couple of years. It's going to actually grow more rapidly. Um, again, as I told you before, the longest cycle in U.S. history is 120 months, and we're at month 90, uh, what is it, 93. Um, this, this recovery is, is not ancient, but it's, it's old. The, but the thing about this recovery, it's had the slowest rate of growth in U.S. history. There has never been a recovery this slow. Now, the interesting thing about this is Re recoveries usually mimic the, re the, the, expan the, the, uh, the recession that preceded them. So the weaker the economy, the more potential there is, the more pent-up demand there is, and usually the faster the rate of economic growth. Uh, in this, we had huge amounts of potential, huge amounts of pent-up demand, and you still had very slow growth. Uh, that is a policy uh, issue, um, and again, with that changing, things are going to be a little more interesting. Um, the expansion is middle-aged. It's not quite old yet. Uh, expansions don't die of old age, uh, but like people, as you be get older, you become more vulnerable to shocks, more vulnerable to diseases, and, um, uh, but uh, right now, 
Uh, there are, are no shocks on the horizon. There's no asset bubbles. Um, tightening of credit, uh, credit is still uh, uh, gonna be loosened, so I I'm not concerned about that. Leading indicators, still up. Consumer confidence is, uh, boy, consumer confidence is actually spiked uh, since he was elected. Um, the Treasury spread, this is the most constant indicator of a recession, uh, the, and that's the spread between 10-year bond rates and a 30-year, or 30-month, uh, three-month bill rate. And uh, again, when, it, uh, that, when the yield curve inverts, that's sort of a historic sign of a recession. We're nowhere close to that. From this, the New York Fed has created a, a, a recession uh, indicator, and as you can see, they're thinking the odds of the recession, a recession over the next year are somewhere around 4%. So almost, almost in economic terms, that's almost zero. So uh, the economy should continue to expand in 17 and 18, and the, the rate of growth should be higher this year and next than it has been, especially once the policies get through Congress. The only thing that bothers me right now, there are excess inventories, especially in autos. Even with that, though, the age of the auto fleet continues to get older. People are keeping their cars longer, and that, to me, suggests that it's not that much of a problem. All right, so let's go through the economy quickly. First, debt burden is low, okay? And by that, I mean there's something called uh, the, the financial obligations ratio, and that's how much of your current income is used to pay for previously accumulated debt. And as you can see, that's way down. We're back where we were in the early 80s. And, and so that means consumers have gotten their house in order. Uh, secondly is consumer credit. The upper line is two things. It's auto loans and it's student loan debt. And we'll talk about that in a, a, at more length in a couple of minutes. The bottom line is credit card debt. And credit card debt today is lower than it was in 2007. So again, it's a sign that consumers are playing things closer to the vest. They learned something from the Great Recession. They're getting their financial house in order, and that's going to hold them in good stead. Consumers uh, have a lot of liquid assets at this point. Um, there's no irrational exuberance. Uh, net worth is improving. Real income is up. Inflation's low, uh, there's no capacity issues. Uh, the uh, government is not a drag on the economy anymore. Fed policy is gonna continue to be expansive. The last thing the Fed wants is a recession. What they're doing now is they're trying to get some bullets in their gun. And by that I mean they have to have interest rates high enough by the time a recession does strike a few years down the road to actually cut rates at that point to, to help uh, alleviate the problems. Housing prices are up, but only modestly or moderately. And so uh, the, 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 the probability of recession are, are, in my opinion, very low. And uh, the effect of the election is this could get interesting. In fact, it already has gotten interesting, obviously. All right, let's talk about Arizona, Greater Phoenix, and specifically Scottsdale. Um, um, this is an unusual recovery in that historically about two-thirds of the employment growth in a recovery has been in the greater Phoenix area. In this particular recovery, uh, about 86% of all the jobs in the state have been created in greater Phoenix. Essentially, uh, what I've been quoted as saying, and I believe it's true, is that you have uh, greater Phoenix and the rest of the state could disappear and nobody would notice for several weeks. Um, and, and economically, that's kind of true. Uh, now, what's gone on is that essentially things are different. For the, how many people have been here, uh, were here prior to 2008? Okay, so a lot, most people. So you have an idea that, that this doesn't feel the same as a recovery. It's just been slower. And, but I want to tell you we've done okay relative to other places. It's only relative to the way we were prior to 2008 that has changed. So you have to look at the world differently. There's a pre-2007 world and there's a post-2007 world. <laughs> and so keep that in mind as I, as I go through these numbers, okay? Uh, 
In terms of, of Arizona's rank out of the 50 states, except during recessions, we were always like second, third, usually just behind Nevada. Um, obviously, since 2008, that has changed significantly. And last year, we were uh, ninth out of 50 states, which isn't bad. It's not second, but it's, it's certainly uh, uh, respectable. And in terms of, there, there are, at the present time, 34 major employment markets in the country. A major employment market has more than a million jobs. And again, we used to rank first or second, except during recessions we fell a little. But in this recovery, it's really been much weaker. Uh, last year, again, we were, uh, as you can see, ninth. Um, and uh, again, not bad, but not normally what people in Phoenix are used to. All right, so the question is, what's going on? Now, uh, again, this is happening for two reasons, the subnormal national recovery, but a slowdown in population flows both nationally and to greater Phoenix. I'm going to talk about this because this is the single most significant thing that has changed in this cycle relative to historic cycles. And it affects places that grow rapidly more than places that don't grow rapidly. And so we've been affected. All right, so what's happened, okay? What's happened is that historically, and I'll show you the data in a minute, coming out of a recession, Greater Phoenix usually has a pretty low unemployment rate and starts creating a lot of jobs. Now, in order to fill those jobs, people are pulled in from other states. They move here to fill those jobs. Well, when they move here, they create their own demand for goods and services. Somebody comes here, he needs a place to live, he probably buys a suit at Dillard's or Macy's, he buys a car from Courtesy Chevrolet, he goes to a ball game, he gets a Slurpee. All the things that people do create demand. In order to fill the jobs created by the demands of those new people, more people have to come in. So population growth is essentially an industry in Arizona. Well, right now we're growing at about half of normal. And because there are fewer people coming in, you aren't getting those ripple effects of, of, those, of those people. Uh, and, and let me show you some data on that. First, the unemployment rate. Uh, this recovery, um, th we started with an unemployment rate which was literally about 50, 60 percent higher than normal. In addition, it took till 2014 to where we got an unemployment rate that was low enough to say, where I could say that was the peak of unemployment in past cycles. Think about that. We, it took all the way to 2014 to reach what had previously been the highest point in, in unemployment. Uh, we're still uh, 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 probably a couple of percentage points higher than, uh, uh, than we should be at this point in the cycle. And so you don't get as many people coming in because a lot of the jobs are filled by people who are here locally looking for jobs. So uh, that's one thing that's going on. And again, uh, the second thing is that, again, take a look at the right column. Um, the average monthly gain during a, a, re a recovery. Uh, and you can see that the Average monthly gain is starting to pick up steam, but it's really weaker than any other recovery we've had. And again, fewer people mean fewer houses, less construction, uh, uh, less Slurpees. And um, uh, so the unemployment or the, the, the employment growth, again, we haven't even come close to our pre-2008 average. Um, it's been, for us, a, an anemic recovery. Um, now. Uh, Something else you ought to think about. If one of the things that's happened here is the labor force participation rate, and that is the percentage of people 18 to 64 who are in the labor force has really fallen off a cliff. It's gone from uh, basically about 69% to about 62%. And it's much worse here than nationally, because nationally is the blue line. Um, and so, you could say, what's happening? Well, there are a lot of people who simply just threw in the towel, said, well, I can't get a job, I'm not gonna, um, I'm just not even gonna look, so you're out of the labor force. Trump's plan, if it is to work, has to get a bunch of these people to say, you know, it's real easy to get a job, wage rates are going up, I'm gonna start looking again. And that, that potential exists. 
Uh, and, and again, um, that also says to me in Phoenix, there's a lot of excess labor that, that needs to, uh, again, get re-engaged, and that's gonna prevent a lot of people a lot of, uh, from, from being sucked in from the outside because they can be filled locally. Uh, and, and again, that suggests to me that the relatively slow growth in Phoenix is gonna continue a while longer. All right, so let's, let's take a look at how, what we're talking about. Um, this, there, there were years when essentially, uh, if you take into account births over deaths, there was net outflows of people in 2010 and 11. Uh, we're now growing. But again, 1.7% is, again, about half of normal for this point in the cycle. Uh, and uh, as you can see, my forecast, the U of A's forecast, the Department of Administration's forecast, all very close. Uh, still, relative, growth is going to increase, but very slowly. Let's take a look at why. Um, we took a look at 2001 to 2006 and compared that to 2011 to 2016, and what we found out was really interesting. Movers from abroad, down over 18%. Movers from other states, down a third. And movers from other countries into the state, uh, or from other counties, rather, uh, uh, down about 14%. If you're moving from Gilbert to Chandler, or from uh, Gilbert to Scottsdale, that doesn't create any new demand in the market. I don't care about that. I'm just talking about people who come from other places. And that's down literally about almost a quarter from, from uh, uh, the, the earlier period. And then on top of that, of the people moving, we captured 8.1% of everybody who moved in 2001 through 2006. We're down to 3.6%. So fewer people are moving, and of those moving, we're capturing a lot less of them. And that is the problem. We also took a look at, at like individual years, and you can see that in 2000, 2000 we uh, essentially, of all the people who moved, the uh, people who moved from outside the local area, which was 7%, it's now down to 4.3%. So essentially, a big drop in those people who are moving. And the Arizona capture rate has literally fallen in half. In 2006, one out of every 10 people who moved in the entire country ended up in Arizona. That's phenomenal. It's down about half that uh, at this point. But again, that's, that's the issue. If the issue is not only national in nature, but essentially because uh, we're not creating as many jobs as we did, and there still is excess labor in the state, uh, we're not getting as many people moving here. Um, that will change a little, but it's going to change slowly. Again, um, it's going to change slowly uh, 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 until, um, or excuse me, before, because it changes slowly, uh, we're going to have uh, less demand for uh, single family, for office, for construction, and for, uh, again, jobs in general. So again, um, we are, uh, again, eighth in population growth, and that's great, really is, it's only when you compare ourselves to what we were prior to 2008, it becomes problematic. Um, and again, uh, population change, as you can see, is, is way below normal, but at least it's picking up. That's good news. And the other thing I'll tell you is, even though, um, and, and again, if in, in 2006 and 7, you had 140,000 people uh, moving to Greater Phoenix. Uh, last year, you had about 76,000. So that's, that's uh, again, that's about uh, almost 70,000 people who aren't here. And that really affects goods and service sales. Okay, so essentially, uh, it's going to be a slow recovery in this. Here's what uh, the Department of Administration is saying between 15 and 20, 1.9%. But between 20 and 25, they also believe it'll stay uh, really at about 1.9%. Um, just to show you the difference, that means by 2025, there'd be about 5.4 million people here. If that goes to 2 and a quarter percent, that would be 5.6 million people. And if it goes to uh, 2 and a half percent, it would be uh, another basically 350,000 people. So small changes in population uh, percentage growth can have a huge effect. Uh, we'll see what happens. All right, let me talk about Scottsdale. Um, there we go, Scottsdale. Um, 
housing permits. Uh, again, housing permits in Scottsdale, we are doing better. Uh, you can see how much we've recovered from the bottom. Uh, don't compare yourself to pre-2007 because it's, it was a different world. Uh, I don't know that we're going to get back there. The red line, though, interestingly, if that, the red line is apartments. And uh, as we'll go over in a minute, the, um, the demographics for apartments have never been better in the history of mankind. And so when you see all these apartments going up, don't worry, they're going to get filled. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that. And by the way, this is a trend that you are powerless to stop. It is a demographic trend as we'll go over. And so you can complain all you want about apartments. They're coming. Uh, number of resales. Again, the number of resales is up significantly. Don't look prior to 2007. Don't look at 2003 and 4. But we are doing well in resales in terms of median prices. Again, median prices are up a lot from the bottom, uh, but we are still below the previous peak. Uh, negative equity, this is how many people who are essentially underwater, who has a, have a mortgage that's more than the house is worth, and that's gone from almost 35% of the people in town down to below 10, and that will continue to improve. Uh, um, that's good news. And then taxable sales, Taxable sales have grown rapidly every year since the bottom, but we are still below the previous peak. That's how steep the last recession was. Uh, and, and you can see uh, in 2009, it was just a disaster, down over 18%. Uh, and taxable uh, hotel and motel sales essentially are above the previous peak, so that market has totally recovered. It's doing well and I would expect it to continue to do well. Let me talk about the housing market generally, okay? Um, in case of any of you are looking for a house. <laughs> this subdivision, by the way, is not in Scottsdale. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about the parade of horribles that we had to go through for housing. Uh, and, and the story is getting a lot better and will continue to get better. The parade of horribles includes negative equity, foreclosures, millennials, student loans, and tougher loan standards. And again, um, how this affects housing permits, uh, I, there's also unforeseen positives. Uh, again, if employment growth accelerates, that's going to bring in more people, more, more demand. And then millennials. Uh, the interesting thing is, um, and we'll see this in a minute, the percentage of millennials moving or living with mommy and daddy has actually increased since the end of the recovery. Uh, that will change. Uh, again, this quote unquote labor shortage I'm talking about, which uh, you'll think I'm nuts now, and maybe the next couple of years, but we are going into a period of a uh, per, basically a perennial labor shortage. So wages are going to be going up, and jobs for millennials who really got um, took the brunt of the hit on the economy, um, that will change. And by that I mean um, uh, they were brought up in a period of plenty. They go to college, they get out of college, and there's no jobs. And so, uh, and so that's why their perspective is very interesting. For those people in, in, in this room, you were brought up in a time of plenty. You got out of school in the 70s or 80s. You had plenty of jobs. You, you, your kids, the millennials, didn't have that. They got out, no job, sorry. And so their view of the world is completely different than yours. And that view will follow them throughout their lives, even during this period of plenty that, I'm gonna be, that I talked about. Uh, okay, let's, it's, um, okay. If you think you're gonna have 2% population growth, there's demographic demand for 33,000 single family units a year over the next decade. We just had a year we had 18, and that was a great year. And the reason is this, and this is, if you believe that home ownership will stay about the same, um, and I'll tell you why I think it will in a minute, um, and you run the age demographics through this, if not one more person moved to town, because there are so many millennials, there would be demand for 150,000 housing units over the next decade. If you add to that, people who are going to be moving to town, that's how we get up to 33,000. Now, 
there will be a lot of people, a lot of millennials who choose to rent, but they will still rent primarily single family detached housing. Right now, one out of every five houses in Greater Phoenix is a rental. Think about that. That's gonna come down a little, but not a lot. Going into this, it was about 10%. Now it's 20%. This is, is um, the home ownership rate, uh, again, is way low. It's where it was back in the 80s, um, and it's probably gonna stay relatively low. And, but that doesn't mean that millennials won't have single family homes. They'll rent them instead of buying them. Um, it's, it's a shared economy, and that's, that's where they are. In terms of negative equity, hard to believe, but in Arizona, more than half of all the homes in the state in 2011 were underwater. Now it's down to about 13, and it's, it's going to continue to improve. That frees up, especially nationally, uh, that frees up people to move. A lot of people were locked in their homes. They couldn't move. They didn't have enough equity. Over time, that will help us. Um, this is foreclosures. The blue line is the foreclosures that actually took place. Uh, the red line is a seven-year lag. If you're going to get a Fannie or Freddie loan, if you had a foreclosure, you're in a penalty box for seven years. And you can see that we're in about a little past the middle of all those people being able to re-enter the housing market. Uh, that's a positive. Um, now, this chart and the next chart show that it, you should never believe anybody who gives you a presentation with a lot of charts, okay? So, um, this, you look at this, and 2012 is 100, you say, wow, look at that. Uh, mortgage availability really has improved. Well, let's go back a few years and take the same thing from 2004. Same chart except we went back to 2004, looks a little different. Let's just say anything you read about a housing bubble, this, that, it's nonsense. We aren't even close to normal in terms of the credit availability for uh, the housing market. Um, we've got a way to go, and so I think credit generally will be more available, not less available for housing over the next several years. Um, let's talk about millennials. I have four millennials, so uh, I speak from experience. Um, there are actually more millennials than there were baby boomers. A millennial is somebody who was born in 85 through 2004, uh, and uh, there's uh, almost 80 million of them. And they will drive everything, just as baby boomers did, uh, for, for the next several years. Here's the most interesting thing about millennials. They don't get married, at least not early. Um, in 1960, uh, 64% of those people, 18 through 33, were married. 2004, the latest data we have, 28% of people in the same age cohort were married. Um, when you delay marriage, you delay having children. When you delay having children, you delay the need for housing and the need to act responsibly. Um, and <laughs> You delay all that stuff, you go to Home Depot, buy, put it in your garage, you never use, okay? And so so this has been, this has been a, quite an effect. Here's the thing I talked to you about. 18 to 34-year-olds, almost one out of every three lives with mommy and daddy. Now, that's remarkable. That will change because jobs are going to get easier and to the point where wages are going to go up and they'll be able to afford to get out. Believe me, kids don't want to live with you any more than you want them there, okay? Uh, I actually used to live in, in uh, uh, up near um, Via Linda in Mountain View, and as soon as the last one got out of high school, I moved and didn't leave a forwarding address, but they found me anyway, so. Uh, let's, so here's something else they're burdened with. How many of you came out of college, how, let's see, how many of you people 40 years old or older came out of college with student loan debt? Okay, Rel you know, relatively few. I came out with student loan debt, but very little, okay? Take a look at the difference, okay? Student loan debt has quadrupled since 2004. It's gone from 345 uh, billion to 1.3 trillion dollars, okay? Um, this is no different than the housing bubble. 
The only difference is you could just get your housing debt dismissed in bankruptcy. Your kids are stuck with this. It really is, is tragic in a lot of ways. And if you want to know why, uh, um, why uh, um, uh, tuition has gone up so much, it's no different than what happened to housing prices. They can. Why do they raise tuition? They can. Because they, they, think, the kid, they think it's free money. And it's, it's really um, unfortunate. Um, the National Association of Realtors does a study every year on why people aren't buying houses. The number one reason for 35-year-olds and younger, student loan debt. Not auto debt, not we're not making enough money, uh, not, not, uh, uh, not health care costs. It's student loan debt. Um, and, and I could go into the, the numbers on student loan debt. Uh, it's going to take a while to work that through. This is not, for most people, it's not postponing a house. It, or excuse me, it's not saying we're never going to be in a house. For most people, it's we're postponing a house, and the house we buy might be a little smaller than we'd otherwise like, simply because of the way the numbers work out. So this one is, to me, the biggest problem, and it's going to take a while to work out. Um, again, if you're paying your student loan debt, you're not buying a house, you're not buying furniture, you're not buying beer. Well, maybe you are buying beer. Um, and um, incomes had better be higher because of their degree. If your kid goes to school and he gets, he gets a degree in a marketable skill, great. If your kid is a Russian literature major, he will be the most educated sales clerk at Macy's. Okay? <laughs> and that's not what you want $100,000 in student loan debt for. Okay. Let's, let's move on. So the housing, reco housing is, is likely to re continue to recover. Uh, oops, wrong one. Um, as you can see, the, the estimates are 20,000 this year, 23,000 next. That is not bad at all. It's a, it's a good recovery. One of the biggest problems, I said, is labor. Uh, it now takes nine months to build a house. It should take six. They, you know, they, you, the number one problem for home builders right now is a shortage of skilled labor. And that labor comes from south of the border. And uh, if I had a, uh, a, a wish list, number one on that wish list would be getting work visas for skilled construction labor from south of the border because otherwise it's going to affect rapidly growing places like Arizona. All right, multifamily. This is, this is what's going near Kirlin, by the way. It's just so uh, um, Let's take a look at the demographics. Uh, you have baby boomers, and you, because of baby boomers, you've had the, the huge uh, demand for apartments in the, uh, in the 80s. Um, take a look at millennials. There's more of them, and it's a longer pattern. So you, you're going to have a lot of demand for apartments way out into the 30s to about 2040. This isn't going away. Um, and especially since home ownership rate is lower. Uh, now, not everything built is going to be $2 to $2.50 a square foot per month in rents. Most, place, most apartments will be worker housing, a uh, buck 40, a buck 50 per square foot. Uh, and uh, you're going to see a lot of that throughout Phoenix. Um, so you have this huge demographic demand for millennials um, and, but also keep in mind that there's a huge demand for retirement housing because so many people are turning 65. Uh, baby boomers, uh, again, are now, you can see the blue, they're about two-thirds of the way through turning 65. What's going to happen? Those who do have equity in their homes, and a lot of them have their homes free and clear, uh, uh, several, uh, you know, a large percentage a reasonable percentage of them will sell their homes, move into a rental unit, and essentially live their lives out on the equity in their home. Um, and so, or they'll, they'll sell a more expensive home back east and move to a, a retirement community in Arizona, and, and that, that will create demand for rental units as well. So essentially, you have millennials, there's a ton of them, because they're delaying marriage, they're in apartments maybe probably six years longer than baby boomers were. And you have baby boomers who are going to retire, some of whom will end up in apartments. And so you have this demographic wave that basically uh, has apartments written all over it. Uh, 
this is something else that I, uh, I um, one of my kids got married last weekend, and uh, I can tell you that when I got married um, in the 60s, uh, I was 23 and my wife was 21, and this weekend my son was 30 and his wife was 28, and that is pretty typical of what's going on, just the delay in marriage, um, and that isn't changing, that isn't changing. Okay. Um, I guess I, something else I had never thought about. Just you think about technology and its effect on. You all know about birth control, but I have a, 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 a cousin who's about 35, and she's she's a doctor, and and she hasn't gotten around to getting married yet, and so she's having her eggs frozen. It's just it, the technology has changed the essentially the need to get married early and the economics of getting married doesn't work the way it did for baby boomers because of what's going on in the economy. So it, it's it's interesting. Multifamily rents last year went up more than seven percent. You don't get a seven percent increase in a two percent inflation economy unless there's a supply demand imbalance. So we're short of apartments. Uh, vacancy rates are likely to stay low, uh, which means that demand will continue. Um, and uh, again, you can see that absorption and completions are pretty well balanced. Uh, and there's, with everything you read in the paper about all these apartments, it's a relatively small number. Uh, and it's not a number that's, that's not going to be absorbed pretty quickly. Um, let's talk about office. Uh, vacancy rates are finally getting down to a reasonable number. It'll be probably 2018 before you get to 15%. That's usually the number where you spark more, more demand in office, uh, uh, excuse me, for, for building office. Although uh, you can see there's been a lot built. Uh, 2015 there was a lot, uh, but you can still see that absorption is exceeding uh, uh, change in inventory, and that suggests vacancy rates are headed down. Uh, there are already um, four markets where vacancy rates are less than 10%, and an apartment office, that's a shortage. Because if you have less than 10%, a big user comes into town, he's, he can't go there, okay? There's not a big enough floor plate. So one of those, obviously, is South Scottsdale. Scottsdale as a whole, central Scottsdale, downtown Scottsdale, uh, South Scottsdale, and North Scottsdale should be a major beneficiary uh, when, when uh, um, the, the building boom in office starts. Um, there's 1.6 million square feet under construction, uh, uh, but uh, basically 900,000 square, square feet of that is one particular uh, company. Uh, 700,000 square feet is spec space. That's not nearly enough. How about industrial? Um, well, again, vacancy rates are coming down. It's been a big box world. Uh, look at the, the amount of absorption, tremendous absorption, for basically big box users. The small guy, the construction related guy, that hasn't come back yet. But the, the absorption is still way in excess of the in, change in inventory. And again, strong demand for industrial as well. Um, and there's 4.2 million square feet under construction. Uh, and you say, well, that sounds like a lot. It's less than half of what we built last year. So essentially, we need more, not less, at this moment in time. Uh, retail. Um, <laughs> so retail has changed. Retail um, meant one thing uh, to, to baby boomers. It means something else to millennials. Uh, retail, given the technologies that exist today, essentially becomes an entertainment experience. Um, Yes, you got to get your hair cut, you got to get your nails done, but the, the, the retailer, the, the shops, you know, all that stuff, that's now a, a essentially an entertainment experience. And if you go to malls, you'll see that. There's more things that are entertainment looking. There's, there's, there's more things that uh, um, try to draw you in. Um, but it's, it's going to be difficult. I will dare say that the number of uh, major retail stores um, uh, department stores we see, uh, it's going to go down. There are going to be fewer of them, uh, and at least several names that you grew up with and just think about as normal, that's gone. All right, so let me finish real quickly. Uh, vacancy rates are coming down, but there's still very little absorption and very little inventory. Um, 
and uh, retail sales are okay, but never really boomed. And here's why, e-commerce, my house is like a uh, warehouse. I come over every day, there's three more boxes, and usually three go back for every three that come in, but <laughs> that, that's my wife, I don't think she's been in a mall in months, which is great. All right, so how's this gonna turn out? Well, again, the world has changed pre-2007, post-2007. Uh, and and uh, uh, again, no traditional boom in Phoenix unless population in increases, uh, the, but after 2000, Eight, the cycle is going to change significantly. It'll be positive. Uh, uh, before 2008, I was saying to people, this is as good as it gets. What I'm telling people now is it probably isn't. It's probably going to get better. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much.